So, um, shall we ask questions? I mean, I'm very happy. You can ask me anything you like. I'm uh, very open to talk about any part of my life. I've had a strange life, really, and uh, I can't tell you straight off the bat because some people are insulted by things I say, so I respond best to questions, as we all do. So if any of you have any questions on me particularly, what it's like to live in America, I can tell you. It's bloody awful. Um, <laughs> I don't know how many of you are on cable. But um, I got rid of cable because I couldn't stand watching too much American television. So what I did is my wife and I uh, got rid of cable and I started learning electric bass, which is, I've always wanted to be a, not a musician so much, but I bought my electric bass and so one hour a night I do my bass and we have the most, well, my wife isn't too keen on it, but um, <laughs> so by getting rid of television, you can really do so much more with your life. I shouldn't be saying this as a television actor, but um, <laughs> television in America just doesn't, it saps your energy. It doesn't sort of get anywhere, apart from the you know, um, channels like A&E and, &E and uh, the ones that show the really good stuff. But the basic commercial stuff, if, you know, it's very hard to swallow on a 24-hour basis. So that's why I would love to go back and Doctor Who. And of course, it would give me a chance. Um, if you remember, again, I don't know how many of you would admit it, but I grew up with a lot of uh, uh, lack of self-esteem. Uh, English actors are quite like that. Um, when I joined Doctor Who, I had never acted. I had never been to a drama school or repertory or had any voice lessons. And like, I had the Wilshire accent then, see, like, and let's talk like that, see, and you don't sort of get too far if you need to be in television. So uh, I did a radio show for two years on the private sector for uh, hospitals for people dying of cancer and things, and that taught me uh, humility, and it also taught me that people like to be, you know, to be cared for, and that's uh, more or less Nick was talking about that. There's so many people that are lonely and happy and uh, uh, unhappy that, that makes you want to sort of try and help them, but you can only go so far in that. So, in answer to your question, yes, if they asked me back, I would adore to be back in it. But I don't think they're going to. I think they need stars. We're not stars. We're just, we were in Doctor Who in England. Well, yeah, but star, I, well, thank you, but like in a way we're not because only you know me. If I walk down in the town now, if Richard Gere and I walk down there, they'd know Richard Gere and they wouldn't know me. And that's why I'm honest enough to say we're not stars. But we, yeah. <laughs> Listen, take his name and address, I like you. So spread yourself around, please. Okay, nice question. Thank you very much indeed. Yes, sir. Um, if it's not too personal, um, why did you move to America? I fell in love. Uh, I, I, my wife left me and I don't blame her. I wasn't the greatest husband. I mean, I wasn't the worst either. Mind you, I should have known the marriage wasn't going to work. I remember the day we got up to the altar and uh, the vicar looked at me and said, would you take this woman to be your lawful wedded wife? And I looked him straight in the eye. I said, would you? <laughs> and he said, no, I wouldn't. I said, well, stop trying to palm her off onto me. No. But we went to Wales for our honeymoon and she fell down that wishing well and broke both her legs. You know, I didn't know they worked. <laughs> no, no, that's unfair. Blimey. Oh, so, oh, I thought you were going to laugh then, sir. A bloody miracle. Um... <laughs> So, I was on my own, and like all men with a big mouth, um, you end up on your own, and uh, I got an illness, uh, which was pretty serious, and it was called big mouthism, and um, so I decided that my life had come to an end. I was 48 years old, and I'd lost my kids, my family, my business, and my house, all in one night, and I thought, well, that's a little bit stiff. So then I became ill, and then by, of all the things that happened, Sheila Camfield, who is the widow of Douglas Camfield, who made me in Doctor Who, he's the one that cast me, he's the one that walked into Barry Letts' office 28 years ago and said, I've seen a young man that I want to play Secret Agent Benton. And since then, I mean, I can't thank Douglas enough. I would never have seen the world uh, the way I've seen it. Well, thank you for, well, for Douglas. He was a marvelous, marvelous man. I think he's an angel now. Yeah. And so, um, like all men uh, who have feelings, uh, I, I died a little, and Sheila phoned me up and said, John, there's a job I've just seen in the Times newspaper for a bingo caller in the Caribbean. And I thought, well, then uh, there's a new occupation. <laughs> so I got the job. I nearly didn't get the job because the guy thought my voice was a little posh. And I said, my God, what do you mean, posh? I don't even, you know, I'm not even sort of, I don't speak like the very posh English. So anyway, I got the job. And I arrived in Miami the very day after I'd finished wartime, for those of you that have seen that little half-hour thing. And um, so I slipped away to Miami, and I joined my ship, and I remember being stunned uh, to see these huge cruise liners. I mean, I'd never been on a cruise liner before. Uh, my father was on the Titanic, which was a bit of a... But I'd never seen... And they were just amazing. And I went all around South America, all around the Caribbean. And... Uh, 
then, as I said, I, I, I fell in love with Jenny. It was sort of love uh, across a crowded room, and it was incredible. And uh, we lived together for three years, and then we had the pleasure of, uh, the, well, actually, the government asked us to get married because the paperwork you need to do on a yearly basis to stay in America as, um, uh, what do they call us, a registered alien. I'm a registered alien, which is weird as a Doctor Who actor. And he, he, no, but he wondered why I laughed when I said, you're calling me a registered alien. I thought, if only you knew, you know, you would have said. But so that was it. And then when we got married, uh, I didn't expect the, the wedding to be sort of grand. In fact, it wasn't. We got married in a, in a movie star's house on Malibu Beach. I mean, why not? He invited us there. And do any of you remember the time tunnel? Uh, yeah. Right? Remember James Darren was one, and mm -hmm. his partner was um, oh, Robert Colbert. Well done. Well, we became friends because we did conventions together. And his ex-wife, um, who he divorced 20 years ago, they're now as old as I am, and so they're back together. Often love finds a new flame when you've been divorced and you've gotten over the, all the stupidity that men seem to have in huge quantities when they're young. And um, so he offered to let us get married. And so Robert Colbert was my best man, which was really nice. And his ex-wife had gone out with Elvis Presley for three years. So we sat talking about what Elvis Presley was like. And uh, I shan't tell you. Um, <laughs> and so that's when we got married. And it's been wonderful. And that's the last, uh, that's all I'm going to do now. I love her so much. It's very nice to be in love. And that's where I'm going to stay. So that's the answer to that. Thank you very much indeed. But did you know it was an American that invented the toilet seat? It took an Englishman to put a hole in it. <laughs> it's a miracle. It's a miracle. Yeah. And I see, oh, blimey, there's another, oh, I can see you now, madam. Look at her rolling her eyes. What the hell is he talking about? Leave the tent, darling. Uh, hey, what about, what about the IRA blowing up? I'm bloody glad I'm not in London anymore. Do you see they sent an IRA bloke to blow up a London bus? He burnt his lips on the exhaust pipe. <laughs> yeah? <laughs> Thank you, dear, but you're too bloody late. Um, <laughs> And, of course, you heard about the Irish mafiosi. Made himself an offer he couldn't understand. Um, <laughs> then there. Um, <laughs> well, at least some of you are enjoying it. Oh, I just hate miserable bastards. They're just, you know, just go away and die somewhere. Uh, any quick, because, I mean, I die up on stage every day. It's quite easy. Any more sort of Doctor Who related questions? Because... <laughs> I don't want to go much further into this. Hey, what about my dad? My dad, um, my dad died. Um, yeah, yeah, well, he died on my bloody jokes. And, you know, he worked at Boscombe Down. And you won't remember it, but about 15 years ago, he was one of the chaps that was blown up. They were dismantling bombs, and he was blown up, and, and it was pretty serious. And my mum had his ashes put in an urn, which I thought, I don't sort of like that. They put the urn, you know, in the front room. And, and I noticed the first three or four months when all his friends used to come round, they always used to say to my mum, we really miss Eddie, you know, and, and, and we really miss him, and we miss him going down the pub. And I noticed that after the sort of initial loss of him was over, the smokers used to, you know, we've all smoked, well, I used to smoke. No, and I know this sounds silly, but you know smokers, when they haven't got an ashtray, they, they go to use their hand, and, right? And in the, and I noticed, they started flicking it in the, in the urn. And I'm in there about a month after that with my mum, and he said, and she was very sort of quiet that day, and she said, you know, John, your dad's been dead six months, and he's putting on weight. <laughs> and... No, no, quick look, because that woman's looking at me, and I'm going to have to walk off this stage. I can't take it, I can't... And I'm wearing these bloody jockey shorts as well. Which I think the jockey's still in them. <laughs> of course, you, have you, any of you ever wear those Y fronts? I used to have those. You know how they get the name? Every time I used to take them off, my wife used to say, Why? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously, any questions? Because if I look her away again, I'm going to say... What are you going to call your book? My book? Yeah, you well, as you know, I told you this morning, I, I love books. I love, you know, I love the classics, as you know. I love Shakespeare most. I mean, I, I get his books as soon as they come out. Um, well, it's just another book by another bleeding actor, really, you know? No, I mean, because that's all they are, aren't they? I've just done a little bit for John Pertwee's book. Uh, it was a very little bit. You can't say a lot in 500 words, can you, really? Uh, not the truth, anyway. And... Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm laughing, I've heard him before. Uh, no, we better do a couple of questions. That was my idea, because I said to Katie, we just seen Bonnie and Clyde. And, uh, blah, I'm out of breath, yeah. It's no wonder, is it, really? Um, yeah, and I just said, you know, Katie, it would be lovely to have one. Let's make out with Bonnie and Clyde. Because, you know, you do pose a little bit when you're in these shows, and it was a wonderful opportunity. And I love Katie. She was a marvellous lady to work with. She was so bubbly, and, and, and she used to laugh a lot. And she made the series really excellent. 
In fact, um, I think Roger and Katie were the sort of real linchpins of the show, and I'm just thrilled to have been in. I'd do it all over again, only I'd like to have had the knowledge, what wouldn't we all? I'd love to have the knowledge we have now, and I could have done a better job, but uh, you seem to have enjoyed what we did, so that was, uh, uh, that was quite nice. So, yeah, any, any, any more questions? Yes, sir. How did your stage play come about? The unit one. Uh, oh, disaster. That was awful, yeah. Well, no, it's not that Richard's a bad writer. Um, it's just that it didn't work. And we did it, we took it to Scotland, you know, to the Edinburgh Film Festival or whatever. And it just didn't work. I mean, one night we had four people in the audience. There were more people on stage. <laughs> no, literally, there were eight of us in the chasm. And I, you know, I said, oh, well, you do the bloody play, you know. <laughs> Ridiculous. You know. Um, but no, it was not very good. And, and I had to wear a dress as well. I mean, <laughs> But I had a job as a butler. I had a job as a butler for about two months, in, uh, and I worked for a very wealthy woman, and it was very embarrassing. One day she called me in, and she it was a bit sensitive. You know, she looked at me and she said, you know, John, take off my blouse. And I was thinking, John, take off my skirt. Oh, my God. And she, John, take off my underwear. And, I thought, and she said, don't ever let me catch you wearing them again. Uh, <laughs> little polar bear in the sub-zero waters of the Atlantic, Antarctic. And he got up on the iceberg, and he said to his dad, Dad, he said, am I a real polar bear? And his dad says, you certainly are. That's why you've got that big, thick, white fur, and you eat raw fish, and you sleep on ice. He said, of course you're a real polar bear. And he said, really? Am I honestly and really a polar bear? And he said, yes, you are. If you don't believe me, go over and ask your mother on the other iceberg. So he dumps into the sea, and it's like 500 degrees below, and he gets up on the iceberg, and he goes, I says, Mum, am I really a polar bear? And she said, of course you are, my darling. Didn't Daddy tell you? He said, well, yeah, but he said, am I really a polar bear? He said, oh, oh. <laughs> you can tell I live in LA. That's it now. Okay. <laughs> and joking aside, that's exactly what it's like. Every other day, there's a bang, and you, everybody, everybody, and the earthquake. Everybody jumps when a lorry goes by. Yeah. So where was? I? Oh yeah, the polar bear. So and she said, well, of course you're up. Of course you are. You eat raw fish, you sleep on the ice, and you've got that big, thick... And she said, he said, so I really am a polar bear. And she said, yes. He said, then why am I so bloody cold? <laughs> Come here. Just slung that one in there, a little animal joke there. I'd had a bad root canal done. I, I, when I lived in England, I didn't even know what root canal was, for goodness sake. I thought it was digging a hole in your garden. I mean, I... And um, every tooth you have done, if you have a crown and a pin, it costs $900 unless you have insurance. That's another thing I just wanted you to know. Every time you're ill, uh, a tooth is $900. Uh, any minor um, thing in the hospital is like uh, $500. Or if you have an operation, it's $900. If you have a cancer operation, it's $50,000. And um, I had this root canal, which this, he was a bogus dentist in Bermuda. And we didn't know it at that time. But all the people on the ship had gone to this chap and he'd left my my open nerve in my, my, in my tooth. And for three weeks I had this open, raw nerve. And I mean, I've never known pain like it, uh, apart from being up here today. And, <laughs> and um, I ended up arriving in Los Angeles, and by good fortune, the chap that got me the flat, his, one of his lady friends, he, her mother was uh, a receptionist for one of the better dentists in LA for 20 years, so they got me straight down there, and of course, at that time, I only had $2,000 on me, and I walked in, and thank goodness he took the pain away. I couldn't have borne it anymore. And it cost me $980, and I remember feeling absolutely sick. You know, I thought I'd rather have stood the pain, actually. But <laughs> So I'm walking, and this is absolutely true. I'm not trying to get any laughs out of this. And remember, I'd only been in L.A. two or three days, so to me, it was just this seething mass of... You know, Hispanics, which are, bless their hearts, all over the streets because they can't get work and nobody will feed them. In fact, I told you, a, a homeless bloke came up to me and asked me for a dollar. He said, I haven't eaten for four days. I said, well, you should force yourself. And, <laughs> and so anyway, he did the tooth. Thank you very much. He did the tooth, and like most of you, I expect one Novocaine jab doesn't do it. I had to have, and oh, it was, well, I was in pain, and, and, and the pain of losing the $900. I'm walking back to my bus, and over there you have what they call the RTD, which is supposed to be Rapid Transport System in L.A. Right. And um, I was walking past, and I saw my first bloke shot. They shoot people <coughs> quite regularly over there, and he was robbing a jeweler shop. It's absolutely true. And they shot the back of his head off, just like in the movies, only real. And as he fell, I was about 400 yards down the road, and all I remember is hearing the, the bang of the skull and seeing all this red liquid going, and they covered him with a sheet like they do. They're almost embarrassed when they shoot someone, but they love guns. They love guns. 
So I'm walking past. Now, again, I mean, Bob knows this, but I used to wear um, kicker. I love those kicker boots. You, they're French boots, and you may not have heard of them, but they're, they're lovely boots, and they, they come in red and blue. And I used to love red because, like I told you, when I was 48 and I'd lost all my family, I decided I'd get red boots to be a little bit cheerful. So I had these red boots, and I've worn them for years and years and years and years. So I'm walking down the road to get my bus. I've watched this bloke with the, and I've walked past. And when you see a dead body, it's like, it's not freaky, but it's, you think, blimey, like that could have been me. Like, not that I was robbing the shop. Um, or, well, I was going to take a cut of the profits, but, <laughs> and I saw it and like, most ballets just walk past as so it's like an everyday thing. And, and I'm looking like that and, and bumping into all these people. And I got to this road, about three roads from where my bus was going from. And, all the people were waiting. Now, you know as well as I do in England, you don't wait to cross a road for the... Well, I mean, if it's empty, you cross. Common sense tells you there's not a car coming for 200 yards, even at the average child, although I shouldn't say this, but you should wait for the green light. But most people cross a road, whether it's red or green. Well, in America, it's against the law. And unbeknownst to me, I'd walk right across this road and again wondered why, why was I the only person walking across the road? I can't be the only one that's in a hurry. Got across the other side of the road, and I was thrown up against this window by this LAPD policeman. Absolutely threw me against this window and hurt my back, and they frisked me, you know, because they force your legs open. And there's other reasons they do that as well. <laughs> and, oh no, there's a very, and um, in fact, later on, we've got 15 LAPD <clears throat> policemen coming up on the stage. Uh, they're gonna form a circle on the stage to show you what a dope ring really looks like. <laughs> <laughs> and, <laughs> And um, so anyway, he's thrown me up against the window, and I'm a little frightened, because they're very, they're like Nazis, they wear the same black, and anyway, he frisked me, and this is how it went, let me just try and remember, he pushed me up, and I remember saying, I used the, the, the F word, which I shouldn't have done, but I said, what the, you know, the hell are you doing? And, oh, I thought you spelled that with that. Um, and I said, what are you doing? And he said, shut your mouth, and, which is pretty difficult for me, but I did. And then he said, what's your name? Now... The irony of this is, I've just told you the story of the changing of the names, I just had my business cards, just 50 of them in the first two days, just because in America, well, I may be here too, you've got to have business cards, otherwise you're just forgotten. I'd gone in and had 50 cards made up of John Anthony Blake. And on all my passports and all the legal forms, John Anthony Woods, but for all the Doctor Who stuff I do, you sign John Levine. Now try and imagine, and this is like, I'm drugged up with Novocaine, because like, everybody's drugged up on something. <laughs> I mean, because I told him we don't have a drugs problem in England. You know, I said, we can get them anywhere. Because um, <laughs> personally, I don't, honestly, I don't like cocaine at all. I mean, I like the smell of it, but... Um, <laughs> so anyway, threw him up again, and he said, what's your name? What well, could I bloody remember? I went, John... Um, um, Woods, love it, uh, uh, Blake. Well, of course, I sounded like an idiot, you know. So then he said, where do you live? Now, I had just left Sunbury-on-Thames, where my address was 110 Vicarage Road. My address in Hollywood is 115 Kenneth Road. So he said, what's your address? And I said, um, 150, 100, um, so I couldn't get that out. And in the end, I said, why are you arresting me? He said, you are a suspect for the shooting. Red boots, suspect of the shooting but also you jaywalked. And a motorbike cop had seen me up that road, recognized the red boots, phoned the other guy, said, get that man. Why else would I walk across a road when no one else was, when there was a dead body behind me? And I thought, my, and I tell you, I panicked. Now the funny thing is, I got, what they do is they fine, they're fine happy over there. I got the fine, which is $50, and um, I, I didn't refuse to pay it, but they, what was the word, because I don't want to ruin the end of the story, but, they use a word that makes it sound as though you need legal representation. In other words, uh, I, no, it wasn't that. It was, um, well, look, I'll leave that bit because I don't know the word. But anyway, it all ended up that I got away with it, but it was a real frightener.